committee meeting. So, Thank you. Um, we do have executive, we had an executive session here this, this evening, and now we are on to public comment. Um, and the first one up is Melissa Sando. Thank you for coming. All right, I'll make a little picture. <laughs> so, honored school board members, uh, Dr. Gall, Dr. Corwell, everyone else is here tonight. I'm Melissa Sando. I'm the mother to Sarah Griffin, who is a student at Sigmaville High School. First, I'd like to thank you for your service and dedication to our community. I know this is not a fun thing that you do in this room, so I really want to appreciate it and everything that you do for the special needs students that we have at our school. I'm a lifelong resident of our own school district. I got graduated from BHS in 1976, well prepared for college. As one of the few students at Mansfield University who knew how to map my art project and do proper notation on all my uh, term papers. Well, at BHS, I witnessed the way the community embraced Wayne Klein, known as Split. He was a trainer with sports teams. Um, he had intellectual disabilities, but that didn't stop him from walking across the stage to a standing ovation in the early 1970s graduation. His participation was exceptional then, because even now there are a lot of school districts that will not allow their students with intellectual disabilities to walk across the stage. This experience helped me make an impossible decision when images and pieces proved that my son would have Down syndrome in 2000. Or, yeah, 2000. But I felt that the Upper Adams School District would support me and my son. His chromosomes split for at early stages after conception to make it just a little different all through his body. I like to call trisomy 21 or Down syndrome the compassion mutation because you can bully him or be mean to him and he will still like you. <laughs> okay, so I know about. I paid attention when I had biology with Delmar from several decades ago. Since 1904, when my son attended the LIU 12 preschool inside the Big Old Elementary School, we have been blessed to receive the best care and consideration from the Upper Island School District. He has global intellectual disabilities and delays due to the Down syndrome. At our first IEP meeting, that's Individual Educational Plan, a Zurich headed to kindergarten, we appreciated that the Upper Adams School District staff for the thoughtfulness shown to me as a parent knew my son's strengths and challenges. We were able to add a goal to his IEP to address starting to read. I know that I was a trusted partner in his education. Through his many placements at the Fairfield Life Skills class, Franklin Township for a year, two years at Eva Charter School, we had the Student Service Special Education Department with us. When I expressed my interest in having middle school and high school life skills classes in our home district to Dr. Corwell around 2013, those classrooms appeared. Now, I'm not so big headed to think that it was just my suggestion that brought that there. I think that Dr. Corwell saw the enrichment to the school, shorter van rides for most of the students, and making friends in your neighborhood, in your own community. I think she also knew that not just students with intellectual disabilities would benefit, but also every student at Upper Adams School District would have the enhanced experience of seeing the similarities and differences people with intellectual delays and disabilities bring to society. The Unified Physical Education and Unified Arts programs bring together typical students with differently able students. These help the students looking for careers with people with intellectual disabilities. And also provides tolerance towards those who are not exactly like us. It's very outstanding. <laughs> with the Bigelville Youth Wrestling and then JV and Varsity teams, Mr. Graham, the athletics director, was very supportive. The coaches and the athletes welcomed him and made a success of his time on his, of his time on the team. As with all extracurricular activities, my very social son, Shen. Yes, he's undefeated because you get two points for a takedown and only one for escape. The other wrestlers kindly put up with his noise and his less than perfect technique. 
Most of them let him pin them and really enjoyed it. And if you want a really good time and you want to just feel really good, go to the Ziggleville Wrestling Facebook page and look at some of their videos. And they have videos of Zurich Wrestling. And it wasn't just that the coaches and uh, his teammates, but the entire school, everybody in that gymnasium, the cheerleaders, uh, the people in the stands, really were uh, cheering for him. And it was very, very, very special. So you must be proud of the outstanding staff at Upper Evans School District, teachers like Amy Haynes, Melissa Nagoti, Pamela Carrera, Jared Stein, all the support staff, some of whom have now gone on to become teachers and are here tonight that work with Derek, uh, educational and personal care assistants, occupational speech therapists, and of course, I'd like to have a special shout out to Steve Crowder, the transition coordinator, who found vocational opportunities for my son and his fellow students, even through COVID. Dr. Corwell has always been very open to finding the best solutions to fit my son's needs. Even when he struggled with fire drills, he didn't comply with expectations, like today. And there have been a couple of episodes where he got concerted in the school. We don't want to talk about that. The creating solutions in a positive, supportive manner were found. All he tells me about school is that he likes math. He's figured out that that impresses most people. He's different, so likely some people don't understand him. But he's often recognized by uh, students and staff members as we're outside in the community, and it's always very positive. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the future holds as we transition into life, but the Upper Adams School District has done its best to make like every student, a constructive member of society. I hope you are proud of the services provided by the Upper Adams School District. I know that I am, and thank you very much for everything. Siri will turn 21 this month, so he ages out of services, so we will leave the Upper Adams School District. But um, so I'm just very grateful for everything that's for that. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Sando. Really very encouraging. Um, next is uh, Ms. Andrea Dolton. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I'm Andrea Dolton. I live at 55 Big Ones, right here in the district. One of my kiddos is a Fibonacci scanner football player. I have three children actually now in district after kindergarten tonight. tonight. I wanted to talk with you a little bit about uh, the issue of the school resource officer. I'm not a public speaker, so forgive me as I go through it. But I wanted to talk about my support for that role rather than an armed security guard in the school. I am a counselor by education, by trade. I run two nonprofits in our county, and I have witnessed the difference between armed security guards and school resource officers and members of the Commonwealth and of Pennsylvania. As far as the school administrators and developing school crisis and emergency management and response to them, they help us, they guide our children, they make friends, they can help when we have mental health issues for our students. An SRO would be part of our 911 system, from my understanding, so they could, in fact, reach out immediately if we had a dangerous situation in our school. And timing is really important in those types of situations. Like I said, they build relationships with our students, helping to prevent them from engaging in the juvenile justice system helping solve problems that can be solved at the school so that our kiddos can go on in life and succeed. So I support that. Forgive me for not being that public speaker, but it was important enough for me to come and speak to it today. And I just wanted to lend my support for school resource officer if that decision is on the table rather than just having our security guards because the relationship, the training, and the ability to work with an administrative team and children is very important to us as parents and I think to the clinicians and other people working with Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Dolgis. You did just fine. <laughs> um, next is uh, Mr. Joshua Fitting. Good evening. My name is Josh Fitting. Thank you for taking the time to listen to what I have to say and also in relation to the school resource officer versus the school safety officer. There's a fine line between the two, and the only way I can paint the picture for you is when you go and buy an appliance, some people go to clothes and some people go to an appliance store. 
while they may have the same name and they may look the same, the internal mechanisms are different. The one from the appliance store is built just a little different. That was what I consider an SRO. What that means to them is, for instance, a school security officer typically doesn't have NIMS training. NIMS training is the National Incident Management System. A little bit about me with NIMS is I am your emergency response coordinator for the state of Pennsylvania for the DOD and the Army. So I'm not somebody up here that doesn't understand the importance when it comes to time management during a crisis. I hold anti-terrorism certifications and physical security uh, certifications for the Department of Defense, and I'm a certified instructor. So what that means is I can take a site like this and build you, build you a re reactionary plan. School safety officers cannot. Police officers can. They're trained. They're certified to do so. We can sit here like we did at the last meeting and beat the horse to death about authority with arrest. We already know that school security officers cannot do that. When it comes to communication, my counterpart hit it right on the head. Our, the officer here, Chief Hartley, and his team have a radio that is connected directly to county. While some of that doesn't, while that doesn't mean a lot to some people, being in law enforcement, I know how important it is to have dispatch at a moment's notice. From the time that a caller calls dispatch, based on the statistics, I hate to throw numbers at you, but I'm a numbers person. So when you look at the average school shooting, they say it lasts about three minutes. It's a lot of time, right? But it's not. So when you talk about communications for a caller, meaning a security officer, to make that call to dispatch, for the first officer to arrive on scene and to cut out the middleman of dispatch in seven to 11 minutes, based on the with that being said, the average response from the three to five minutes, which saves countless time. Additionally, we talk about the investigative rights. The school safety officer does not have investigative rights. What they plan to do, or what I feel they intend to do, is to shuffle this work off to our already training, causing them to have to come up here for every possible incident, taking away from our taxpayers and bigger bill that are requesting service as well. Then we talk about ORI numbers. Well, what is an ORI number and who can charge? We've already determined that school safety officers don't have the ability to walk through this hall and charge for any infractions, whether it be paraphernalia on site or a harassment charge on site. Your police officers do. So there's a very fine line difference. We talk about really <laughs> Thank you. And uh, next final is uh, Chief Adrian Hartley, Bigglerville Borough Police. Good evening, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity tonight. Uh, I'm Craig Hartley. <laughs> uh, first thing I'd like to point out, uh, that is there, in my opinion, there is a big difference between a school resource officer and an armed security guard. Other than the more than just the power to arrest. All right, the two positions are, in my opinion, totally different. Comes okay. to statute 24, which I have copies for all board members to pass around later on. Comes to statute 24 clearly defines what the powers and duties of both school resource officers are and school security guards. The statute under Title 24, Education Section 13-1313-C, it's titled School Resource Office. I'm going to read the section. Subsection A, Powers and Duties. A school entity or non-public school may confer the following powers and duties upon school resource officers. Number one, to assist in the identification of physical changes in the environment, which may reduce crime in or around the school. Crime and to recommend. 
recommend procedural changes. Number three, to develop and educate students in crime prevention and safety. Number four, to train students in conflict resolution, restorative justice, and crime awareness. Number five, to address crime and violent issues, gangs, and go around the school. Number six, to develop or expand community justice initiatives. Okay, so there are six items that are defined under the powers and duties of the regional trust. Okay. Pennsylvania statute title 24, education section 13-1314-C, school security guards. Okay. Section A, scope of services. School security guard may provide the following services as determined by the school entity or non-public school. And if you would, please note the difference in the definitions. Powers and duties are assigned to a school resource officer, and scope of services is assigned to a, or defined for a school security guard. And continuing with the sub, subsection on the duties, or the uh, scope of services for the school security guard, number one, school safety support services. Number two, enhance campus supervision. Number three, assist with disruptive students. Number four, monitor visitors on campus. Number five, coordinate with law enforcement officials, school police officers, and school resource officers. This particular section clearly defines the roles. As you can see, the security guard has to still coordinate with law enforcement <coughs> regardless. And number six, security functions which improve and maintain school safety. The previous six items are clearly related to a security guard. The SR is not only able to perform his or her duties, but can also perform the duties outlined for the school security guard. So out of the 12, the school, uh, school resource officer can do all 12 duties. The school security guard can do only his six, which is basically armed security. <laughs> and I gave you guys all copies of those to review. All right, to address the required training, this was brought up at the last meeting. Uh, True Brochet, Patterson, Tower, Virginia, and myself will both uh, attend the school resource officer training. Uh, in addition to this training, we have both agreed to the table over 25 years of law enforcement training and experience to the job. So I'm just hiring a newbie. You have over 50 years of experience in law enforcement. Uh, my job's duties, restrictions, and supervision for probably more than 20 years. That's how he ended his career. All right. Um, in the past 20 years of handling basically everything that happened at this school, one of the biggest benefits to hiring an SRO versus an armed security guard is the ability to free up educators and administrative time. So many times I got involved in a situation with a principal, assistant principal, a teacher, or other faculty are dealing with a criminal or disciplinary situation involving students, parents, or others. These incidents happen frequently and they tie up two to three hours uh, of educators' time or might go for two to three days. I've seen that firsthand over the last 20 years. Right. In these situations, the administrator, teacher, or other district employees that is not hired specifically to get involved in these situations are not teaching or educating. So if you take the salaries of these individuals times the number of hours involved in every one of these incidents throughout the school year, ask yourself how much money is wasted on disciplinary action by educators that should be teaching or educating, not disciplinary. Uh, as an SRO is here, they are scoring law enforcement officers with hours of arrest and investigations to assist in these situations. The time and money saved, in my opinion, is invaluable. And based on the previous mentioned job description, in my opinion, one of the biggest differences between an SRO and a school security guard is proactive versus reactive. Right. I know that some members of this board have expressed concern about students being arrested at the school. I'd like to clarify the term arrest. I have arrested numerous, well, probably in 20 years, hundreds of students here uh, for multiple attractions. Okay, and most of the time, 90 plus percent. In fact, I can't remember the last time if I have ever actually physically handcuffed a student here and removed them from the school. So when we say arrest, all right, I, I get a 
call from like the teachers to or a principal or whatever, I come up, take the report, and I usually end up filing the charges through the court system, which means um, no one's arrested or handcuffed or taken out in, in cuffs in front of anybody. All right. So even though they are technically being arrested, you have to know how to define that term. All right. Basically the same as you be an issue to traffic citation on a traffic stop. Okay, it works the same way. And an SRO here would not do anything different. All right. Touch a little bit on the budget. Um, I had initially quoted the startup cost of $7,765. Right. That is a, a roundabout number. Um, it's not set in stone, obviously. And I did some uh, adjustments to it. Um, $850 for a laptop, $500 for a printer, $5,775 for a camera system in a car, and $600 for a cage in a car. We decided that um, yeah, for right now, I'd be willing, we can use one of the many or two bigger little police cars if it needs to be transported. So, with just those couple of items uh, being taken out, that's a savings of $7,725, and that brings the cost down to $80,040. Now, just also keep in mind that um, the school district is eligible for um, a grant, or they can get grants, but also they can be involved in the um, surplus program at the state level. So. If in the future there's money available, uh, you could end up getting a car that's already equipped for a little bit of nothing. You just have to be visiting about it and look for it. Right. Uh, I spent three terms as a township supervisor, so I am fully aware of the difficulties involved in making and uh, trying to make decisions based on getting the best bang for your buck for your constituents. All right. I, I was responsible for the taxpayers for 18 years. All right. So I know what you guys have to go through, right? And in closing, I'd like the, the board to please keep in mind that the SRO is approved. It is a first for both of us, uh, the Upper Adams School District and the Biggerville Police Department. It will be a trial and error for a little while in the beginning because it's new to everybody, all right? So there's gonna be some hiccups along the way, all right? But I can assure you that from my standpoint, I will bend over backwards for this district. <coughs> and if you talk to or any, any of the other faculty teachers, they know that I'm available at the drop of a hat, whether I'm sitting on a boat in New York, wherever I'm at, I answer my phone. And the school resource officer, or myself, will continue to do that. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Can okay, we move on to um, athletics? Uh, there is nothing under um, on the agenda. There is nothing under number five, other student activities. And then we come to number six, uh, under curriculum. And first up on 6.1 is uh, the TRAILS program update, with presentation from Dr. Corwell. Good evening, everybody. Um, normally you see uh, Mr. Alvin on uh, curriculum night, so I hope I do half as good a job as <laughs> <laughs> Um, I didn't know there was a difference between you. You're so <laughs> a team. Okay. We never see one without the other. <laughs> While we're waiting for this, I'd like to. Um, sorry, I need to disconnect. There's nothing in agenda manager. No, it's not in agenda manager. I, it's, I'm going to have to go on. You're going to have to log off and I'll have to go on. Yeah, it's not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not the taping. Power shut it. Nope, I got it. And I will say the reason um, we are not, we don't have this in agenda manager. Um, we do have some students who requested <coughs> um, that the board see them, but they just didn't want their faces. So I'm happy. 
have with me tonight, um, this is Maggie Mancuso. And uh, just a little bit about Maggie. Maggie, um, Sarah's mother actually mentioned that Maggie has been a PCA in our district. She has been an instructional assistant in our district. And now she is the teacher in our intermediate school um, behavior intervention program in Mrs. Buckley's uh, building. And she's done a fantastic job. And let me tell you, for a position like that, I had to do a lot of arm twisting to get somebody to really take this position because it's not an easy position. She is kind of the go-between when we have students who need a little bit of extra structure in their day, a little bit of support. But these, it's more of a proactive position. These students aren't to the point where they need to go to an alternative placement. Um, when um, Mrs. Mancuso agreed to do this position, she said, you know what, I will do this, but you need to let me be creative, and you also need to let me see what some of the other programs are doing. So one place we visited was Yellow Breaches, and um, Mrs. Mancuso said, you know what, I think I can do this. I think I can take this and do a version of this in my classroom. So now I'm kind of going to let you take it from here, and I will chime in as necessary. So come on up here, and I will start this. And uh, feel free to chime in too, Mrs. Butler. Okay. All right. So um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Maggie Mancuso. I am the behavioral intervention teacher at the intermediate school. And um, I would like to share with you the behavioral intervention program that we are partnering with Yellow Breaches. And it is, like Dr. Corwell said, it is a smaller version of what they provide at Yellow Breaches. I just took from what I saw there and then brought it into the classroom. So this is our uh, comprehensive plan to implement behavior interventions and supports to match the school board's values. And what we do at the intermediate level is we use what we call the CARES program. And the CARES starts for, stands for cooperation, um, accountability, respect, effective listener and um, learner and citizen, and self-control, which is all the things that we use in, within my classroom and without within the whole school building. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Sure. This is a mission statement that we came up with for our program. Uh, at, as you can see, the incentive program is designed to help students achieve personal goals, whatever they happen to be, because all our students have different goals in which they need to learn. We have life skills, self-independence, and building, uh, coping skills, confidence, mindfulness, and behavioral intervention. And these are all things. For example, like I would say with the mindfulness, I always start my day with a mindfulness routine. It could be a workout, it could be yoga, it's always like start that day in the morning and in the afternoon. And the coping skills are based on whatever comes and needs that to me. So here's the goals for some of the students that we felt that with Ms. Buckley. And um, these are things that the really target goal that the kids need as this year. And they could continuously change because we can see different kinds of things come up that we really need. These are the concerns. Attendance with one, academic improvement, um, favorite mindfulness, and peer relations. And so in this program, we provide our students an opportunity. As you can see, one of the things we did in the picture there, that we went to Messiah University and we did uh, kayak safety. And they, they were amazing. They were amazing. But we designed a monthly trip that the kids have to work for and are given the opportunity to be able to take part of this. Um, at the beginning of the school year, I just wanted to go through this. In the beginning of the school year, I meet with the Yellow Breach instructor to plan the trips for a year. And as a team, we decide the appropriate activities because at the intermediate level will be definitely different than high school level. So we come together that a challenge that's to promote growth and for the students. They also is recommended to give the groups between eight students with two adults just because um, the ratio allows the risk management during the adventures, activities, and students get more attention, and everybody fits in one band. It's easier to see eight students than to see 30. And then what I want to do is to kind of walk you through a day of what our trips look like. 
for example, um, and we did horseback riding. And on horseback riding, we went to uh, Rickety Bridge, which is right here in the community, and we went in there and we do a, what they call, um, to get to know you, because the students are only the same students. They're always different. So we do a question, we get in a circle, talk about, like, what's your name? And something will ask like a question, like, what's your food or what's your favorite holiday? And it's just like, to make some kind of connection with each other. And the next thing is we do a team building activity in which they, whatever, the horseback riding. And the kids, it's not they don't get on the horse. They actually have to groom the horse, um, get to know the horse, learn its name, make some kind of connection with it, put the groom it, put the blanket on, put the saddle on, and they have to walk it around. Um, and they're all taught through this with the instructor there. After they did it, then we went and did the around the circle. And we had students, Mrs. Buckley, you were more welcome to time in on this. Because Mrs. Buckley was with us, yeah. and we always <laughs> had somebody go with us because we want the teachers or whoever. We had to teach um, Mrs. Buckley, we had a counselor go, because they need to know that connection also of what the trip program is all about. But they also, in the trip, um, they are responsible, they learned accountability, communicate with each other, they have to trust each other, they have to respect each other, um, and in that, um, they, it's just like so encouraging for each other. They build that confidence that you don't really see at school because you're, for whatever reason, between academics and getting things done, but in there, you see them smile about it, and it's like, hey, that was great, and they also learn to, um, the conqueror of fear. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, Mrs. Bobby, you might share this. Story. I would love to share this story. Um, mm -hmm. So, I was able to go on the horseback riding one, which I loved. Um, and there was a particular student who felt very confident um, that he would be fine. He would be fine. He would be fine. Mm -hmm. But the moment that uh, everyone left him in the stall by himself, Please don't, leave me. please don't leave me, please don't leave me, please don't leave me, please don't leave me. Um, so it was really interesting to hear and to see uh, after the, by the end of the time, he was fine by himself. So that confidence of him um, overcoming his fear, and you've seen that, you see that a lot in these, pro in these programs. The water, there are kids who are afraid of water and petrified to go in, but by the encouragement of the other students and encouraging them, they're all kind of encouraging each other to get in the water, particularly ones who didn't want to get in. And by the end of the session, they are comfortable in the water. They're having fun in the water. Um, so we see that so many times in the, different, in the different activities that we do. And I think that's so valuable for these kids to create those bonds with each other. I think it's valuable. And not only with us, but with Mrs. Nekuso, with himself, with Mrs. Nekuso as well. So valuable. Yeah, and I'll just jump off that because we had a student that in the beginning of the year would be screaming in our face. And then, I mean, like, literally, like, get out of here. I want to go home. Yeah. And then now he can walk down the hallway and he's like, hey, how's it going? Yeah. So he, we made a connection and because of on these trips. Yeah. And he's like, you know what? They're seeing us in a different view. And it's so nice and encouraging that, yeah, there you are. And it, it seems to bring them to a different level. Um, after, I just want to say to, is that at the end of the activity, we always call it what we call a debrief. And I ask the kids, we always have three questions we ask them. And that's kind of what was your thorn? What was your stem? What was your rope? Now, your thorn is what you really, that you found you struggled with. And they'll just tell us what that is. And then the next one would be the stem, which is what, what can I do better next time? And they always end with the road, what you really enjoyed about it. And it's interesting to see how each one of them had a struggle of something, how they conquered that, and then what they really enjoyed about it. Um, yeah. And then these are some of the responses that the kids had. Like the, the first one is that I'm glad that my mom made me do this. I really had a good time. Because he was like, I am not having any part of this. This is not what I want to do. And then when he's like, I can't wait for the next trip. And they would see me in the hallway, and they'd be like, what's the next trip? Where are we going? And then I got to the point where I'm like, I can't, I'm not going to tell you it's going to be a surprise, because then I found that they were only working for certain trips. So I'm like, 
No, no, no. No. <coughs> you want it? You got to work for it. <laughs> but like you said, they got to try new things. They met new people because so many students, like the students that I have right now, it's first grade to sixth grade. So they really wouldn't interact at all. But it's nice to see that they're going from different classes and they're like, hey, you know what? They're helping each other out. It's really awesome. Um, the rock climbing, they were really encouraging each other on the rock climbing. I wish I videotaped that because some of the kids, and the reason, some of the kids are so encouraging. We had kids crying because this isn't like the rock climbing wall. This is put yourself up and it's a big wall. Oh, and um, it's out by Mount Alto. But they got on there and we were just like, oh, shake a rock, that's what it's called. And we went out there, and some of them couldn't make it, but they were like, just one more step. It was persevering. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm taking the sun for Ms. Buckley. And they persevered, and they went, and they went one more step. And they like, you did it. And now come on down. And what I just wanted to add to this is that with each activity, the students that have participated in the program this school year, I've seen encouragement, respect, Trust, confidence, communication, and mindfulness. And I really believe in this program. I actually just want to uh, share a little bit about money because I know money tends to be important. Um, when we do an outside placement for a student, say at Yellow Breaches or at uh, River Rock, or at um, Adams County Learning Center, we are probably paying around twenty to twenty-five thousand, plus about five thousand in transportation costs. So it's a lot when we have a student with a lot of money. Now, this program, um, we set this up. We had some money um, in special ed funding that we were able to get things started. But I just wanted to share with you. Um, the folks at Yellow Breaches are so on board with this program and so open and wanted our students to experience it that they had started out, we had started out with um, uh, a cost for 12 uh, adventure-based uh, trips. And they ended up giving us seven for free. And we only had to pay for, I think it was this year just two. This year just two trips. Mm -hmm. So they, I mean, we basically did this year for free. We pay for transportation. So it was amazing. The other thing that's come out of this is this Mancuso is a pretty smart lady. And she was able to take notes as we were going through these trips. Now, some of these trips, we absolutely need the assistance of the folks from Yellow Breaches because they have the know-how and the capacity to help us with some of the dangerous trips. But there are some trips that we can do locally for a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. um, for grant money, and actually I have access funds that we can kind of keep this program going for about another year, I believe. Um, but it is... Um, and um, I'm really impressed with how, um, at both Yellow Breaches, how they have been so generous to us and how um, Mrs. Mancuso has been very frugal with her money. And again, we ended up paying for two trips. <coughs> so what I would like for the future of behavior of the intervention program is that eventually, once we get all the teams stepped out at the AME level, because this is just the first year of doing this, is that you know I'm, I'm, I'm learning as I'm going and making whatever improvements I can and to make this successful, this program more successful. I would eventually like to take it up to the, to the middle school because I can really think that we can utilize it. Because that's just a part time too. Middle school is really tough. So I would like to expand it. Um, I also think that the students have a unique 
experiences because a lot of these kids have never done half these things. Like the paddle boarding or even horseback riding. I mean, when we went to hike, people were like, this is the first time I ever hiked. And we have some great parks around here. Um, and also I think that with the experience outside the classroom to motivate the students to, to learn and to learn about what's outside beyond these walls of the school. Um, I would like to sum up the program though. It is an opportunity for students to take part in an adventure and experience education outside the traditional school setting. Um, the program will focus on building social emotional health through activities that develop teamwork, communication, patience, self-esteem, problem solving, and there's so much more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Sure. I suppose Poaching is not exactly what you're doing. <laughs> but, borrowing. Borrowing. <laughs> borrowing. Borrowing. Uh, but I commend you uh, for your efforts to help these young men and young kids uh, move on. And it's just kind of shocking that uh, living in a rural area that kids have never hiked. I mean, it's just staggering to me. Congratulations and thank you for what you do. Thank you. I also want to have I have a question or two, but thank you so much also for your presentation. It really is inspirational and um, makes us all proud. <laughs> but um, how many students are you actually working with in your class? Is this only um, um, is it a program that's specific for your class? It's not just, all the just, students. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, it's not just for kids in my classroom but it's also for throughout the school. And Mrs. Buckley and I have come together and we talked and said, well, what other teams in the school can we can really benefit from this program? So we do take other people. I only had a small group, but, and then, and they have to earn it. Mm -hmm. They don't, they, this is not a given. Mm -hmm. They have to earn it. Mm -hmm. And they have to, and I do have a key here that they have to make 80% of whatever their goal is. And it is keep the daily track. And if they don't make it, they don't make it. But if they do, and then Mrs. Buckley would say, well, you know what? This person would really benefit from this program. So I'm assuming there is somebody who stays back and does the regular teaching day with students mm -hmm. that do not qualify. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, then uh, item 6.2. Um, you want to... This is the English Language Learners Family Day Activities, and the person responsible for this item is the ESL staff. Yes, and I have two wonderful ESL teachers with me today. I have Lisa Kuhn and Megan Fuller, and uh, they would like to share um, the wonderful day that we had at Hall of Balls. We had um, our biggest family day ever. Um, in the history of doing family days in our ESL department. And it was just so wonderful um, that the ladies wanted to uh, share some additional information. So my name is Lisa Coons. Um, I'm the ESL teacher at uh, Browns Middle School and also at Biglerville Elementary School. And I'm Megan Puller and I teach ESL at Biglerville Elementary School. Um, on Saturday, April 9th, we had a family day event for all of our ESL families at Hollabaugh as part of our community outreach efforts for Title III. Um, every ESL family from Biglerville Elementary, Upper Adams Intermediate, and Upper Adams Middle School were invited to attend. Um, and they were invited both through a paper invitation and a personal invitation at parent-teacher conferences. The day of the event, families could stop by any time between 2 and 4 p.m. Um, and we are very excited to share with you that we had 210 people in attendance. Wow. In addition to the middle and high school helpers, making this by far the most successful ESL family mm -hmm. event to date. Usually we have like 40 
Um, so as you can see with the pictures, um, we had several activities that the families could partake in. Um, we had cookie decorating and a spring craft, which they're doing right here, both of which um, they had to read directions and follow the directions to make the craft, so we were trying to incorporate a little bit of literacy. Um, also to incorporate literacy, every child was able to go home with a book. Um, we also had a scavenger hunt where the students had to go around to different resources that um, are available to families locally. For example, um, the Harbaugh Thomas Library, the Collaborating for Youth After School program, and summer camp, Ready Rosie, which is a program that we offer through the district, and the Migrant Education Program. Families who complete, completed the scavenger hunt were eligible to win several prizes, which included several different types of STEM kits. Um, and we had a grand prize of a laptop computer, which was won by one of our third graders. There was also an Easter egg hunt, um, yard games, and a photo booth for the families to participate in, which is where a lot of the pictures came from. Um, and the pictures are all being developed and will be sent home with the families within the next week. So we would just like to conclude with a great big thank you to Dr. Dahl and Mrs. Buckley, Mr. Showers and Dr. Corwell for coming to support this event um, the day of. Uh, we'd like to thank Ms. Weaver and Ms. Ortega for volunteering their time to help us uh, translate. And if you don't know who they are, they are our fabulous ESL aides at the middle school and the high school. Um, and we honestly couldn't do half what we do without them. Um, we also want to thank that Upper Adams Daisies supplied uh, a small portion of the Easter eggs and candy that we used for our Easter egg hunt. And finally, the event could not have been possible without the support and donations from Hollabaugh. Um, they allowed us to use their farm and um, gave us some apple cider for the families that day. Um, so uh, we really appreciate that everything that you continue to do is for our families. And the students um, came in the following Monday, and that's all they could talk about. And the kiddos that didn't come that day were very upset. So they are already, <laughs> they are already asking for a date over the next year so they don't miss it. So. Thank you. I don't know how you <laughs> ladies could be split. Yeah. It was amazing. It, it was absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful. And it was so much work. And you, you guys did it all. It was amazing. This is one of our kids that won the step kit. It was very organized. And I know the Hallowalls really appreciated being able to share their facility. Well, thank you, ladies, Wonderful. for everything that you do and, and this presentation this evening. I assume if you're ESL teachers, you both speak Spanish? I do. Or, yeah, we both do. Well, a very small um, pitch. <laughs> Poco? Um, Poquito. Um, the greatest thing about ESL is when you think about it, um, you could teach outside of D.C. and work with children who speak many languages. Yep. There's no possible way to know them all. So really ESL is very much about um, supporting their English development and not necessarily relying on a second language. Thank you and so these much. Are just some of the feedback the students, so. <laughs> all right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank very, you. very well Thank done. You. <laughs> and you moving on. Student services has just some amazing staff. Yes, indeed. Um, and then finally, Dr. Corwell, you are going to talk to us about the life skills classroom update. Yes. Um, I had, um, when Sarah's mom asked to speak, it um, got me thinking about what we have accomplished with the transition program. And um, although Mrs. Crowder wasn't able to come today, um, we do have um, one of our LSS teachers back here, Mrs. Jurisic. <coughs> Is at the middle school, and um, Mrs. Crowder put together um, a PowerPoint to share with you all, just to give you an update on what she's been, um, what she's been up to the last uh, year or two. Um, I think you had a little update a couple years ago, but it's been a while. So I'd like to share that with you tonight.
The state of Pennsylvania requires special education training and services to begin at age 14 and continue throughout each student's secondary education career. In addition, we strive to meet the district's vision of all students, college, and career ready. While the transition program encourages post-secondary education, employment, and independent living, this presentation will focus on preparing students for employment and independent living. Over the past four years, your middle school and high school educators, with the help of our talented support staff, have developed a transition program that not only meets the program that not only meets the needs of our district and consortium students, but allows students to experience independence and success. This short recording will share how each classroom works to meet the specific student needs while exploring employment and independent living. In our middle school classroom, headed by Jessica Gershon, students develop the basic skills needed for employment by operating a school-based enterprise of a coffee and tea service. In this program, students learn work-appropriate communication skills, how to fill orders correctly, how to interact with customers, make coffee and tea, apply basic food safety skills, find their way around the building, and provide delivery with a service. Once the program is fully up and running, the business will be charging for their products. And this will bring a real-life financial component into the classroom, including handling money, making change, unit prices, profit margins, inventory, and shopping for supplies. The feedback from both parents and customers has been extremely positive, and the kids love working. In addition to the coffee business, students have the opportunity to work in the cafeteria packaging the food items and cleaning tables before and after student meals. To develop independent living skills, students have jobs in the classroom, and throughout the building to develop their basic living skills. Academically, they work on identifying safety signs, comprehending menus, schedules, and forms. Students also create tasty treats on a regular basis to develop cooking skills. Tasks within the classroom, cafeteria, and building-wide allow students to participate in the activities of daily life, from meal preparation to laundry to cleaning. In our high school life skills program, Mrs. Carrera's students maintain a small flower bed outside the preschool classroom. Each fall and spring, students trim the school weeds and plant flowers. Some of the flowers begin from seeds grown in the classroom. Students volunteer at the SPCA where they work with staff to clean the cat rooms, wash food and water bowls, and do light cleaning. Their favorite part is loving on the animals. Students also run an SPCA donation drive once each school year. Other community involvement includes the Upper Adams Senior Center, where they make and deliver Christmas cookies, and an Adams County Shelter donation drive. Students participate in on-campus job experiences, such as taking inventory, or restock snack items in the learning commons. They work in the cafeteria dishroom and work with the cafeteria staff to prepare food prior to lunch. Students learn how to safely use small and large paper shredders. Also within the life skills classroom, each student has a weekly classroom job. Twice a month, students go to the culinary room to make simple recipes. Students read recipes, measure ingredients, and use kitchen appliances and clean up. 
In the 12th grade through age 21 classroom, we continue our partnership with Gettysburg College and continue to provide opportunities to work in dining services, the dining room, the dish room, and the athletic center four mornings a week. In addition, UASD has created a central office intern position. This individual makes copies, assists with mailings, completes miscellaneous duties as directed by our wonderful administrative assistants. Students also have opportunities to participate in shopping excursions to resupply our vending machines, purchase cooking supplies, and participate in a new opportunity to develop skills to fill a new job niche created by COVID, custom shopping, and order pulling for customers. We continue to operate a vending machine which integrates comparison shopping, rotating stock by date, counting money, identifying unit pricing, and maintaining a working budget. In addition, students assist in the in the cafeteria, packaging food items, and assemble furniture when the opportunity is available. Thanks to a generous donation from members of the community and space provided by Centenary United Methodist Church, we now have an apartment classroom lab to develop skills related to the activities of daily living. The skills focused on in this lab are housekeeping, cooking, budget, bill paying, shopping, and transportation options. I'll leave you with one last quote to consider. John F. Kennedy said, things do not happen, things are made to happen. Through the planning, hard work, and dedication of the apparatus, teachers and staff, with additional support of parents and the community <laughs> and funding and vision provided by the school district, things can definitely happen for our students. Thank you for your time. I just want to echo a comment that I've made each year that, you, that this has been presented, and normally Dee is in the room, but she's not this evening. Uh, this work that, that she does, as well as the other people associated with this program, is providing inestimable help to those that need more help than all the rest of us. And, and uh, she does a wonderful job, and I congratulate her again. Thank you. I would echo that, and um, I just I think it's fitting that it is um, Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, I have been blessed to work with so many amazing teachers, and um, I thank you all for that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Corwell. And uh, we move on to item 6.4, move to approve the graduation listing for the class of 2022. Recommended to A listing that we don't have. I actually do have it in a sealed envelope if anyone wants to see oh. the list. It is not made public. Okay. Um. I suppose there's some double secret probation reason why it's not public. Some of them aren't going to graduate. Is that what I'm being told? <laughs> no, it's never been published that I'm aware of. Right. Oh. Well, we're not going to approve anything tonight, but in two weeks, you're going to ask me to approve a blank check. Hmm. No, I have That's a discussion it. for a future <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Okay, and then we move on to Dr. Dahl and uh, the information regarding COVID. Hard to follow up after Dr. Corwell's presentations. <laughs> she did a nice job. Thank you, Ann, for bringing those to us. Um, <clears throat> the community transition transmission rate for uh, COVID, I just checked it. It's still um, around 5.8%. We're still lower in Adams County compared to surrounding counties. Just a reminder, we're continuing to report these throughout the remainder of this year. And then um, if we see numbers similar to what we have right now, this will be removed from our agenda next year. Our current COVID and quarantine um, cases in the, the district as of yesterday, it was zero and zero. So uh, we have zero quarantines and, and zero COVID cases. I know that you know there are still some cases out there, um, but currently we have no uh, cases as of yesterday. <laughs> so that can change at any minute. So those are the first two. <clears throat> Wonderful. And we're done. Can go into the next yes. area if you would like. I know we had a number of public speakers talk um, 
to the um, topic of school resource officer um, and school security guard. And um, I spoke a little bit about it last at the last meeting and um, would just to, like to follow up. I know there were a number of conversations and this may lead into more conversations in the future. We're all sharing the screen tonight. So what I would like to do, and um, some of this information was shared a little bit earlier. Um, Chief Hartley shared some information, so I apologize that some of this may be duplicated, so I can go over this a little bit more um, quickly this evening. But I think it's important for us to take a look at uh, the differences between a school resource officer or an SRO or as it is outlined in school code SSG, a school security guard. What I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of a background um, about what we have done over the years and how it's led up to this point, give you a little bit of supporting safe schools information about the district needs and a recommendation. Some of the costs in my presentation are obviously going to be different than some of the costs that were just shared publicly um, at the beginning of the meeting. And um, there were a number of board questions um, that were brought to my attention and a number of them that may have been given to me, um, I think just prior to the meeting that I haven't had a chance to respond to. So what I'll try to do is, is answer those the best I can and get those back out um, to the board in the very near future. So I'll try to focus on the first three areas, the background information, supporting safe schools and costs during this presentation. There was a lot of conversation about how we got to this point, and I think it's interesting um, for us to recognize, it's important for us to recognize that school safety continues to be um, something that is part of my annual goals. It is something that is always at the top of my mind, and I'm continually reminded of that almost on a, um, an hourly basis at times, um, even throughout weekends. School safety is the top, top priority for us here within the district, and we currently utilize staff members that we have internally to help with our school safety um, implementation. And as needed, we reach out to people that have that expertise and try to seek that the best that we can. We don't have anyone that's on staff currently full time who can address uh, safety related um, concerns, but we do have people that we do send to conferences and, and trainings that bring back information and share it with us. And we do discuss that as an administrative team and within our buildings. We do a number of drills that are mandated throughout the school year. Uh, more recently, the Safe to Say mandate. Uh, we're seeing a, a, a large uptick in the number of uh, reports coming to us from Safe to Say since COVID. Um, it's been amazing to see um, how many um, you know, responses that we're getting um, last Friday, for example, last Friday evening, I received two. So these are coming to us during weekends. These are coming to us at night. If it is something that is an immediate concern about somebody doing self-harm or harm to somebody else, we are contacted directly from Harrisburg. And there's a list of us that that is given to Harrisburg. They have our um, home numbers cell numbers and they continue to go down the list until somebody picks up and they will not give up until somebody picks up and they let us know about the situation and then we are to um, give them information so they can do a wellness check, for example, if somebody's talking about doing self-harm. This is something that has increased. It's a 24-7, 365 day a year vacations whenever, whenever we get a safe to say response we are mandated to follow up on that. And sometimes we're mandated the time that they are received. They are screened at Harrisburg. Um, they're through the attorney general, a connection through that. They are screened and then when it's determined on what level it comes to us at different times. If it's something that, that can be uh, 
investigated the next day. It may come to us the morning, of, you know, the next day or the next morning. If it's something that is an immediate concern of self-harm or harm to others, that comes to us whenever. It could come to us at any hour that that is received um, by the Safe to Say um, office. Some of the research, I know there were questions about, well, has the superintendent done any research on this? This has been ongoing over for over a year now. Um, I have reached out to multiple Pennsylvania counties, um, superintendents in those counties that have SROs. Those exist right now in Adams County, York County, Franklin County, and Cumberland County. So all the counties surrounding us currently do have examples of SROs within schools, and those are schools of different demographics, um, all different types of demographics. There are also uh, some superintendents who have gone the route or the direction of doing a school security guard or an SSG. Um, those are located right now. The ones that I've reached out to are in Adams and York County. When looking into this and from conversations with super, superintendents in neighboring counties, they, they mentioned about um, you know, reaching out to the sheriff's department. I did contact our local sheriff's department, had conversations with them. Um, they are extremely limited on what they can do as far as providing services to our school. They directed me back to our local police. Our local police seem to have um, the most authority from the information that I've researched. I've also reached out a number of times for security um, questions and possible resources. Um, I've worked with Warren Bladen at the Adams County Emergency Services Center. Um, there are certain uh, trainings and such that could be uh, utilized here and, and perhaps some services as well. There are some security services personnel that we have utilized in the past. We've utilized them here on this campus, um, so gathering information from them, and also different types of police services personnel reaching out to some of them as well. Um, my, uh, I have um, connections with police officers in different states, and I've reached out to them to get input. I've also had over the past, um, during my tenure here, I've had a retired state trooper who does um, security for an entire county in Maryland attend our district and give feedback as well. So I think it's good to have outside people coming in and providing perspectives to keep us safe and, and providing a different perspective on um, our school district and providing feedback to us. And we do take that seriously. We did have a state um, police report, a full report that was done um, at one of our buildings, and it was nice that that particular officer did a walk along with one of our administrators in a different building on our campus or on our district and provided verbal feedback. Um, that is something that's not always done, but um, the uh, state trooper did agree to do that. This is a listing of some of the things that, that we have completed um, the, the several years that that I've been here. Uh, these are some of the things that we've put into place when money is available. And, you know, we're trying to utilize the money that we have as efficiently as, as we can. Um, we have done trainings that have been free, um, but then with the trainings, for example, the, uh, the Stop the Bleed training that we had was, was free, but then we had to <clears throat> purchase kits and it took us a while to, to, to purchase the kits to get them throughout the district, but those are the little red bags that are in throughout our school that you see here. Um, so we, we try to do the best we can, but again, my background is not training for safety and security, although it is a responsibility that I have as a district superintendent. When we hire people, we're hiring people who are educators. They are people that come to us certified as educators, and we are sending them away for, for trainings and bringing it back. It's not an expertise that we have. I'm not going to go through everything, but I think you get a gist of the, the types of things that we have done. If you look at that list, we have done a lot over the past several years of trying to increase um, security. Two of the big ones is um, having a secured vestibule here at the 
the central office where people are not able just to walk into um, our high school uh, to come around the corner and come into our central office and also Biglerville Elementary to make that more secure as well. So why is there a need now? Um, we're using you know, our current staff that we have here um, for emergency training, but the level of training that local law enforcement have and their experience and expertise is something that we don't have amongst our educators. Our educators are trained to be educating students and providing instruction to students. There are a number of unfunded mandates that continue to come to us. Safe to say is one that came out recently. Um, you also heard over the past um, two meetings that there are certain reports that, that need to be brought uh, to the board for review. We've done that the past two years. We'll do another one this coming year. And then from that, we will also um, need to report a number of things to our state. So there are continually, um, there's continually an increase of reports that are due um, to the state as, as well as, um, you know, different types of reports that are due also to, to the school board that, that are in law. We're also noticing a number of challenges um, both locally and throughout the country with increased concerns among staff with the types of things that we're seeing. As I mentioned, um, the types of reports that, that we receive on Safe to Say, um, I, I don't want to say that there's a connection with COVID, but it seems as if, you know, we're getting students all coming back now. Um, there hasn't been a normal routine um, for about two years, and now that we're bringing people back together, we're starting to see some of the challenges with that. And, you know, we're seeing some things that may have happened over the two years that, that are coming out in different ways um, with either just people being angry or, um, you know, situations that may have occurred um, throughout COVID. So we're trying to do the best we can to work through that and provide a safe environment for our students. Staff, you know, continue to make uh, decisions the best that they can on safety, but again, we're trained as educators and not as uh, resource officers or uh, emergency personnel. We do have access to outside um, experts, and I shared that, that we do, but again, we're relying on when they are available. And I will share that a number of the people that have done research with, I have reached out but there are times where it takes a while for someone to get back in touch with us. And, um, you know, that's always a little bit of a, a concern when we're trying to address things as quickly as we can. Recent scenarios where we have included um, police involvement, um, unfortunately, some of you may have been part of, you know, certain types of hearings related to student behavior or decisions, bad, bad decisions that may have been made by, by students but, but are still, you know, upheld by, by law or by policy. Um, those types of things have involved our, our local police mainly for the secondary campus, which is our local Biglerville Borough Police. We have had, you know, over the years we have had some school threats um, that have been made, and they come in different different types of methods and, you know, it could be someone that may overhear something that gets passed on and it gets embellished, but still those are things that if we hear about it, we must do the investigation and we have to investigate to find out, even if it was somebody that was making comments and it was overheard by someone and it was taken out of context, we have to almost prove that that is a scenario that will not happen within our school. We've had some challenges with some of our, our board meetings, and um, we've had some campus <coughs> vandalism over the years, and we have worked through some challenging situations with allegations of racism um, over the years. So each of these in some way or another have involved some type of local um, involvement with, with uh, law enforcement. There are two different options in school code. One of them is a school resource officer or an SRO. 
The other one is a school security guard or an SSG as it's outlined in law. And I'm not going to go into a lot of this detail because I believe this is what Mr. Hartley, Mr. or Chief Hartley had presented, is that correct? Mm -hmm. He handed it out. So I'm not gonna go through all this again, but he went through and verbally talked about each one of those areas individually. And then um, the school resource officer, you know, as was mentioned, they they work be beyond um, law enforcement. I look at them as as an educator who could collaborate with stakeholders, whether that be um, our staff here or parents. They're also looking at a um, and working with us as an emergency management person with safety plans and strategies. They're also an informal counselor. The thing that we continue to hear about is the relationships and how important that is for our students to have positive relationships with staff. And there are a number of times where students do come to us and share information and then we seek that out to prevent things from happening. So having those informal um, counselors, and that's what an SRO would do, building those relationships. So in short, being a positive mentor to not only our school employees, but also the students and, and providing that, that unbiased perspective um, when working with our students. The other statements I believe were already reviewed by, by Chief Hartley um, during his presentation talking about the non-punitive techniques. Um, you know, you automatically think of somebody, a police officer being in school, certain things are going to happen. That's not the case. In this case, you know, an SRO, my um, my thought of what that person would do would be building the relationships and then having somebody on staff who could address an issue if it did involve the need to call for, um, you know, a law enforcement officer. And then the SSG, again, uh, it's, it's a different level of um, what they would provide the district, not as, as detailed as a, uh, a school resource officer. And again, these were read to you earlier. I'm not going to, to reread them, but, but these are the, the, the areas that, that fall under the, the school security guard. District needs, looking at increased oversight of our district safety components, by a trained individual who has the ability to remain current on practices um, impacting national, state, and local safety topics. So conducting student and staff trainings, monitoring mandated monthly and annual safety drills, performing our um, building risk assessments and providing recommendations and monitoring implementation of those recommendations that would be made to our administrative team or the policy committee if we're looking at updating policy. Decreasing the response time for local and state police. Um, when a call is made, there is a delay depending on the ability of a law enforcement officer to, to be here. Just making the 911 call doesn't mean they're gonna show up you know, 30 seconds later, there's a delay. Having someone here on campus would assist with, with that re response time being, being lowered or if there was something that happened, if we only had one, even the response time to a different building, you would have the, the time it would take for a person to get from one building to the next versus somewhere else in the county to, to get here. There are times when, um, you know, our local borough police may not be on duty as well. So, you know, that, that could also impact, you know, the time to, to respond. Again, building those relationships is key and preventing or de-escalating issues that, that could take place. Again, additional district needs and looking at it, building positive relationships again between the law um, enforcement individuals and students and or adults. You know, sometimes there are negative feelings about individuals and, and hopefully helping to build those relationships could assist in two different ways. Um, from the perspective of the student or parent and or also, um, you know, the law enforcement person or the SRO. The other 
items have been uh, discussed earlier. Um, one additional area that could be discussed or added is traffic safety matters. That is also something that, that could fall under the, the purview of an SRO um, and, you know, addressing any kind of, of traffic um, situations that could occur as well. So the recommendation would be to form an agreement with the Biglerville Borough Police Department and provide an SRO for the district to be housed at the middle school and high school, create an intermunicipal agreement with the um, Biglerville Elementary School and the Upper Adams Intermediate School campuses. And um, through that, we would need to bring forward a detailed agreement based upon the district safety needs um, to have the board review. I think I'll end it there because I believe we talked about this at the last meeting uh, regarding where certain monies uh, could come from. I think Chief Hartley talked about this a little bit as well. There are grants available um, for certain monies. Title IV could also be a possibility um, of utilizing some money in those areas. And this chart is not updated with the figures that were provided this evening. So I'm going to stop. At that point, I have a number of questions and answers from some of the board members. I will send that to you in an email so you can review that instead of taking time here to go through about 15 more slides. Okay, have any questions? I believe it, it would. Um, what I'm recommending is that we would go with a uh, school resource offer. Okay. Um, as I said earlier, <clears throat> there's a lot to consume here and time is short. So I think there's a, a real possibility that this will get deferred to, to next year. Uh, however, we can talk about that some more now and at the next board meeting. Um, but you've, you've provided us an, an awful lot of information will, here tonight. I'll pass that on to the board. Okay, great, thank you. I think that completes the yes. curriculum, thank you. Uh, Candy, we're going to move to the business and operations, and so let me know when you're ready. I have to work with your speed here. Okay. Uh, we're not going to take roll call, but. Um, I will note that nine are here, although two have just uh, vacated the premises. I'm sure that the bio will break, they'll be back. Uh, so we move to uh, property. Uh, Mr. Walmer, Jerry. Uh, we have the use of facilities. Let me, let me get on it here. That's the Head Start letter. Uh, number 2.1, use facilities contract with Adams County Head Start. Move to approve that contract. That's a pro forma. We have been, we've had Head Start. We provide them a location. They provide everything else, including the money to run the program. Any other discussion on that item? Okay. Next. And item 2.2, where declaring a surplus. A number of items that are 
I, I'm assuming Famous. old and worn out. Yeah, and I can read them off. If no, no, I don't think okay. that's missing. Did you have something, Mr. Yeah, Graham? Yes, it is a store equipment that has been sitting around that we have yeah. used. It is outdated. <coughs> the intention would be to try to trade and obtain some equipment that we use. Okay. So declaring them surplus, but trading for something newer and nicer. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Okay, I think that's it for uh, property for now. Uh, I don't see anything under transportation, so we'll go to finance, Mrs. Krause. Okay, the first item, 4.1, is the 2021-2022 Yes, so just continuing with our monthly tracking of the ESSER funds and also attaching the MO and new things um, adding up as we go through the year. I will add that... Um, with the help of Mr. Alvin and Mr. Brad Showers, um, we did have to submit a federal update as well, but this was related to the 2020-2021 spending. Um, so this is now another annual report that we will have to do on um, ESSER reporting at the federal level. Um, so the, that report for 21-22 will then be due in October of this year. Um, so we continue to monitor these, these funds. Um, I have also updated the funds that we've received from PDE this far. Um, so some of these expenses will actually carry us into the summer as well as we look at extended school year and um, monitoring those events. So this form will probably, you know, starting after July into August or so, we may actually see two, one for this current fiscal year and then one starting for the next fiscal year as we keep um monitoring those items. Well, I'm a little confused. Um, we have a column called budget and a column called actual. So are we on the hook for the difference between the two? On a, you know, and the reason I ask is this is May and the budget year ends next month. So like the extended school year supplies, we will be purchasing some of those supplies yet for this summer. So what's budgeted for 1500 that will change where our actual is $71.29. Will we spend all 1500 Maybe not. Once again, if we don't spend it in this year, we have to allocate it for future years to spend okay. by 24. And you quickly went to the absolute lowest one on the list. That was just the first one I saw. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm looking at ESSER two total of $820.4,000. And we have received seven hundred and one point six thousand. So there's a difference there of a hundred and fifteen or eighteen thousand dollars. So presumably, since the line says budget, it was in our current FY twenty two budget, and we haven't received the money. So what was budgeted for this current year was about a hundred and eighty. Eight hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Right. We have received and we've spent seven hundred and twenty-four thousand dollars so far. Okay. And we have received from PD as of the end of April one hundred and seventy-four thousand dollars. Okay. So, so I should not read the eight hundred and twenty thousand dollars as money that we spent. That is correct. That's okay. just what was budgeted, but we have not spent that at this point. Okay. I feel better now. <clears throat> I mean, that's a that's a big difference, and we're running out of time. All right, that uh, that will placate me for another couple of weeks. <laughs> Any other questions for the ESSER fund? Okay, the next item is the 2022. 2025 identical renewal contract. This may be an item that we put on hold. We just found out today. Um, well, let me back up. So, uh, last week, that the radios that we per that we ordered using Title IV funds for this current year were not going to be here until November. So, we were looking at ways to use the Title funding th that we're due for this year for 21-22. So we are going to renew our Identikid um, early so we could, there's also a cost savings, and use the title funding. But as of this morning at 8 o'clock, we received notice that the radios are now here. 
<laughs> so this will this may not go forward, but we just didn't want we did not want to remove it at the last minute as well. So we wanted to be transparent. Okay, um, I'm I'm like the lowest common denominator here. So help me understand the connection between radios and identikit. Okay. So radios and identikit, we could use Title IV funding for both items. And the radios were currently in Title IV for this year. For FY22. That is correct. But since we received notice that they were not going to be here till November, which is after our fiscal right. year, we needed to spend the money. Funds. Got it. <clears throat> for identikit. Yeah. Spend it on something we knew we had to spend. Okay. It on. And so now the radios are here, so we're spending the money on that. When does Identikit expire? September. So then we will be looking at I using do. title funding for next year or ESSER funds. Okay. Next year. I I it's I understand the action. Yeah. And that's a license. Identikit that is correct. versus radios, which are it's hardware. One right. time. It, correct. Okay. All right, but in any event, it doesn't affect. This is the domino effect of trying to spend money that yeah. you have to be cautious of how you're spending it so that we're not, There's you know, rules when. There's each program, <laughs> and to keep all those rules straight, sometimes it takes all of us in the same well, room together. <laughs> that's why you're on the payroll, I think. Not only uh, rules, but timing, too. That is correct. It, yeah. yeah, it's the timing of when it has to be paid. And Mr. Alden ordered these radios. <clears throat> yes. Okay, so the radios are coming in, and we we have to look at FY23 title money for Identikit. All right. What is Identikit? It's software that identifies a kid. Yeah. Oh, well, I identify take it from there. If you visit our schools <laughs> and you come in and sign in, you just say to and get a badge, that's identity. So it's our visitor man. Come in late. Okay. Early. You have to. Like Every I, time I go in, I take my badge and scan it and so forth. But if you're just a regular, you know, you don't have a badge, you use your driver's license and it is attached to some yeah. database somewhere that says that Jerry Walmer is not a bad person. It'll take a picture of you. Put it on the badge, and then you just put it in your. It's identify the tire to walk through the building. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's it really it's doesn't not identify just, yeah. the kid. It identifies. <laughs> the yeah. Make sure you're not on the most wanted list and so forth. Ours is out here in the uh, in the vestibule out here. Okay. Uh, in the outer office. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that? Do the radios work when we get them? Okay, yeah. next item, four point three is the acceptance of the following donations of four thousand dollars from the Upper Adams State for the Environmental Educational Program and half pints ice cream donated waffle cone cases and gift cards for staff appreciation from half pint creamery and Well when we have our board meeting and approve this, somebody help me remember to point them out because it'll be in the uh, consent agenda and point out how appreciative we are of the community support. <clears throat> okay, moving on, the next item. Um, can I put these two down? together, yeah. Okay. Item 4.4 4 is the delinquent 2021 for capita taxes, and 4.5 are the delinquent 2021-22 real estate taxes. And 4.6, a listing of 2021-22 tax exonerations. So I'll start with the easy one for the exonerations. We don't have any. Um, and then going back to the real estate and the per capita, this is what will get turned over to the York Adams Tax Bureau um, for delinquent tax purposes. And you can see I've created a chart um, from previous history seeing that our delinquency, our turnover rate has been going down, um, at least since 2019 that I have noted here. The exonerations are actually exonerating the tax collector because that person's left or moved or correct? Taxes, not exonerations, would be if there are certain qualifications that a property would be exonerated, okay. but we don't have any of those uh, okay. set for this year. 
I'm going from previous, and I always thought it was exonerating the tax collector that that person's no longer in the district or whatever, and therefore it gets taken off that tax collector's bill. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, it, it could is, be that yeah. too. Okay, That's so correct. Yeah. Do you have any idea why it's going down? People are being more timely in paying per capita in real estate. Um, it could be with, and I'm just making some assumptions at this point, you know, with maybe the stimulus, you know, people paid their, they had the funds to pay the bills when they were due. Um, wages increasing. I mean, we did see a big, you know, as I was reporting on real estate taxes earlier, like through July, August, and September, we were seeing a higher increase of those paying their real estate taxes during the discounted period. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next item is the budget presentation for 22-23. Okay, so this evening we're going to do a quick recap of fiscal year 22, do a recap of fiscal year 23, what we're looking at um, for the starting July 1. I'm um, talking about the final proposed budget that needs to be prepared and um, approved for adoption um, by the May 17th meeting, and then just reminding of the timeline as you know, we get to the very end, because sort of the last... Uh, two months here, we are, you know, really detailing everything, really looking at everything every day, every week, um, as we look to for a final budget in July. I mean, I'm sorry, in June. Um, just if I may interrupt for a moment, at our next board meeting in two weeks, we will be required to approve approve a preliminary budget, and so that doesn't mean that that's the final budget. Why it's called preliminary, um, <clears throat> but it does mean that whatever we approve in terms of tax increase, if we approve any, he, the final budget cannot be higher than that. So the, the, what's left in the process is the preliminary budget, and then 30 days later, the final budget. So as we look back at fiscal year 22, when the budget was approved on 6-15-2021 for this current year that we're in, it did include a 2.1% tax increase. The revenue is just shy of $31 million. Expenditures were a little bit over $31 million, and we had a deficit of $731,000. At that point, we were um, the board said that we would be using the unassigned fund balance and some of our PEASERS fund balance to cover that deficit. But as you've been hearing from me the last several weeks, um, I don't think we're going to have that projected deficit at this point. And I did not change the numbers um, that we talked about, I think, two weeks ago. Um, with the month of April just closing, I didn't have time and to pull all that together for an updated. You will have that in two weeks. Um, so once again, it's just showing that at this point, I'm looking at a, you know, a positive balance of 565000 Once again, we don't know that 565000 what will be allocated to our unassigned fund balance or to our non-spendable fund balance with LDT. That's our health insurance that we, we can't um, touch that money there. So once again, we cannot assume that all that 565 is being added to our unassigned fund balance. So once again, I just wanted to review what I have on the Treasurer's Report each month. Um, 
where we talked about the non-spendable, which once again, that is our LBC non-spendable fund account, fund balance. We currently have in our signed debt fund balance, a little bit over $2 million. We have a Peasers assigned fund balance of 231 And then we have um, medical for 350 and our unassigned as of 6-30-2021 was $2.2 million. Um, but as we mentioned, you know, we're looking at having a fund balance, or not, sorry, not a fund balance, but a positive variance of 565000 So in updating what I think we may have at the end of this year for 6 30 um, would be our non-sendable. Right now, the assumption is that we will have the same amount Debt service um, and our signed fund balance, the two million, the PGIS two hundred and thirty one, the medical three hundred and fifty. But you will see in the unassigned, I did assume that we would add fifty thousand to that. So I did increase that. Once again, that's an assumption. We're taking that from what we added last year to our fund balance of the unassigned. So I'm working off the two point three million as our unassigned as we start to looking at fiscal year 23. Um, as we switch over to fiscal year 23, um, local service, local sources, once again, we talked about that. Um, that's a lot of our local taxes, um, earned income. That number has not changed since what I presented two weeks ago. And that assumes no tax increase. That is correct, yes and with a collection rate of 96.75 on our real estate tax. And I will share, I think I shared two weeks ago, I was unsure if we would hit that number. We actually came within $1,000 of what was budgeted for local taxes and what was received. So we're at 99.99 of what was budgeted. Um, so state resource sources, um, what I presented two weeks ago compared to now, that has changed. And what I'm assuming is, um, that we would get an additional $200,000 in state revenue. I shared last time that if you look at the charts that are out on the state website for basic ed funding, special ed funding, and Cumberland Perry, we have some big, what they're assuming at this point, very high increases. I think I mentioned that basic ed, they thought that we had seen an increase of over a million dollars. I don't believe that is true. Once again, everything is quiet on the Harrisburg side. We should start hearing some of that chatter very shortly. Um, but this is assuming that, you know, 200 would probably be a reasonable number at this time adding to state funding. So you will see then that the revenues have changed to be 32 million. Expenses did not change where um, I have the 33.9 million. It does update the variance to be 1.9 million, um, where two weeks ago we were talking about 2.1 million. So I just wanted to, any questions on what I've changed from two weeks ago till now? That's adding the 200,000 from the state. The state. <laughs> so, how do we look to balance the fiscal year 23 budget? And these are some options that I've thrown out. Um, this is, you know, conversation that the board needs to have for to provide direction for me um, going forward. We still have contract negotiations that need to be settled. Um, in the current budget that I have prepared for fiscal year 23, it does have still in there the central registration in individual for 25,000. It still has in there the maintenance agreement for 41,500. And it still has in there the resource officer of the 87,000. So all of those are still in that 1.9 um, variance number. Nothing has been taken out um, until you would like to direct me to do so. 
We could also use funds from the assigned debt service. Um, as I mentioned several weeks ago, we have a bubble year of the increase of $517,000 for a bond payment. We can also use our un unassigned fund balance. And just as a reminder, our unassigned fund balance can only be between 1 and 8 percent, 1 and 8 percent of our expenditures. And that is also referenced in our board policy 623. And there could be a tax increase if the board is directing so. So these are all options that I've thrown out, you know, and I've coupled some of these as we look at some future slides here. And as a reminder, in January, the board voted not to increase taxes above the index of the 4.8%. So I've put some options out here if the board is looking at any options. Um, this would, I'm going to start from the left and work to the right a little bit, and then I'll talk through the other slides as well. And this is, once again, assuming the unassigned fund balance that I just mentioned a few slides ago of the 2.3, adding that 50000 um, from where we audited at 630.21. This is without a tax increase. And showing if we if the board would desire to use um, 520 is what I I picked from the um, assigned debt fund. You know that we have that two million dollars in. If you want to use any funds from the Peasers fund, and then what would the ending unassigned then be as well, and where we would be at the end with our percent in expenditures, referencing that board policy of 623. So this first one is showing an increase, a zero tax increase. Once again, I just use scenarios, I'm not saying anything is final until you have directed so. The next option I, I put up here was a 1.5% increase of taxes, and that's you'll see that percent in the third column. Once again, running the same scenarios that I just mentioned using the assigned debt service, um, assigned Peasers fund by increasing taxes by 1.5% that generates a little bit over $200,000 in tax revenue. So that would be added to our total revenue. So if you see that number changing throughout the slides, um, that is why. And I have an estimate of what it would be to the average homeowner by the year and then by the month. It's average property value. And then we continue on with the same format. Um, the next one was looking at a 2%. And that generates a little bit over $268,000 that would be added to local revenue. Once again, um, showing the average increase along with for the year and by the month. Another option I put out there was a 2.5 that generates $335,000 additional revenue. And then the last two options would just be a three and a four. I just put, once again, I want to show options but once again, options can be in any sort of the range from zero to 4.8. Um, so it all depends on what the board desires are. And as Mr. Wilson mentioned at the beginning, on May 17th, I do need to present a preliminary final budget. But the final budget cannot be higher than what is approved on May 17th. So May 17th. June 15th. May 17th would be the preliminary budget. Yeah. Can be higher than what is approved on the June 21st. So, you know, once again, we need to think of all the conversations that we've been having over the last several weeks and months, um, knowing that we still have some things that have not been finalized 
to really um, form up those numbers. So at this point, I will turn it over to Nilsen, Mr. Wilson. I'd like to uh, share my screen, but uh, somebody's going to have to help me do that. I don't think you can. Sh oh, yeah, you can. Well, here she's going to have to unshare first. We can't, two people cannot share. Sorry. I think it's the. make this a bit bigger. This is not a PowerPoint, so oh, yeah. but I think everybody can see that. Um, I also just passed this out to you. <clears throat> so I wanted to kind of take all the information that uh, Shelley provided us and boil it down into a simpler document. Uh, well, simpler, I think. Um, but first, I want to go through some of the bullets up here so you can have a sense of where we have come from. Over the last 10 years, uh, we have raised property taxes 27.93%, which is about 2.79% per year. In that same period of time, Act 1 index has actually gone up higher, 31.2% um, or 3.1% a year. Uh, over the last five years, Property tax has gone up 13.76% or 2.752% per year. That's slightly less than over the 10-year period. And the um, cumulative Act 1 index has been 17.8%. More to the point, three of the last five years, uh, property tax increased less than the Act 1 index, although one of those years it was above the index and one of those years was also zero tax increase. So we have figured out how to um, to pay our bills without raising it to the to the maximum amount. Some of that has to do with the fact that the major increases in PEASERS have now stabilized, stabilized at an extraordinarily high number, but they're not going up like they used to. Um, as Shelley pointed out, Policy 623 establishes uh, the limits for the unassigned fund balance between 1 and 8 percent, which means the midpoint's about 3.5 percent. And I also want to point out that Shelley has <coughs> these numbers that I'm about to present to you, so you know they're back of the envelope until she says they're right. Um, <clears throat> the, the budget projected unassigned fund balances by year, you can see those numbers, and uh, this year the projection was that we would be at about 3.49%, so right about in the mid-range of, of the uh, 1 to 8%. So what is this unassigned fund balance? The unassigned fund balance is the district savings account. And we have other assigned, found, assigned accounts for specific <coughs> unassigned is is our savings account. You know, it's for when something breaks or we have an unexpected bill come up. Um, and so it's, we need to treat that um, like any family would treat their savings. You know, we, we, we want to protect it, but we also don't want to necessarily never use it. So FY23 expenditures with with all of the ads, there's only three, is the $33.982 million. Um, if we took out all of the ads, it would go down to $33.828 million. And I came up with a third category of the expenditures with the central registration and the next gen of 33.89. So in other words, of the three ads, if we took the SRO out, and we would we would have the figure you see in front of you, and I've listed those as some ads, just to clarify as we go through. 
so um, recognizing that Ron Ebert is colorblind, I put the colors here, but I also put numbers so that you could follow along with us. And so what I tried to do is go 0, 1.5, and 2% tax increase and for the three different categories, one with all the ads, one with no ads, and one with some ads. And the numbers over in the various colors on the other side are what our unassigned fund balance percentage-wise would be. Um, so, and I have the comments down at the bottom there. Let's see if I can keep, oh, uh, I forgot to mention the assumptions. The assumptions here are that we use $520,000 from the debt fund and $60,000 from the PEASERS fund. And that that's the basis of all these numbers, just as I, I picked the bottom lines that uh, um, Shelley just presented for, uh, for the debt service and PEASERS funds. So what all, what is all, what does all this mean? Well, if you wanted, now, now we get into my opinion. Um, if we keep all of the ads in and we have no tax increase, the unassigned fund balance goes to 2.885%. I am not comfortable with that. I think that's too low. If we just use some of the ads, then the unassigned fund balance goes to about 3.089% percent of expenditures and that's that's okay i'm okay with that excuse me tom let me mm -hmm. ask the, the projected ending unassigned fund balance that's what we would be left with is that what you're saying correct okay. yes and there's another assumption that's built into that and shelly went over that you know right now there's a variance of 565,000 and change almost 566,000. we're assuming only 50,000 of that goes into the unassigned. Mm -hmm. We could be wrong. It could be more than that. So, um, so you see the three options for 0%. I get my cursor to move here. Uh, some ads, and then finally no ads. Um, and the comments that I have down here, um, 0% uh, tax increase with no ads leaves the unassigned fund balance in great shape, but the ads or some of the ads may be necessary. I'm not making a judgment on those ads at this point. I'm just telling you what the impact is as I see it for, for doing that. Uh, then we go to 1.5% tax increase. If we keep all the ads in, um, it goes to uh, 3.477, which is essentially what it is what it, we're projecting it to be at the end of this year. And so, so that's fine, although it includes a tax increase. And then you can see for some of the ads and no, none of the ads. The important thing, again, this is my opinion, is I do not think a tax increase of 2% or greater is necessary. That's my personal opinion. So, it seems to me that the trade space is somewhere between zero and one and a half. And uh, if, we, if we look at that, I think we can have our discussion as to what's, what's what. Um, my personal belief is that somewhere between zero percent of, with some of the ads or um, one and a half percent with all of the ads is probably where we should be thinking. And so I color coded this. Uh, the red is things that I'm not comfortable with. I don't think either I'm not comfortable with or they're not necessary. Green is, you know, very good. And the two blues are, are okay. So discussion. The, the ads, Tom, you, you may have mentioned what the ads were. Are we talking about the SRO? We're talking about the SROs. Yeah. The ads, the ads are, uh, and it was in Kelly's, Shelley's brief, 25000 for the central registration, 
41,000 for the next gen uh, on the air conditioning and whatever, and 87,000 for the SRO. So the two first, the, the first two together is about 60, I wrote it down somewhere, 64, 65,000, yes? About 60, 66,500, 66, thank you. So, um, you know, those two together, are still cheaper than than the SRO by itself. Um, so so now we need to decide because Shelley needs to have something to think about and put put the numbers together for next time around. When we come here in two weeks, we have to have to approve a preliminary budget. With the next gen maintenance agreement. Um, if we opt not to do that this year, can we still do it next year? Or is it like one of those things, you know, where you got to start the warranty right away? If you wanna... From my understanding, we have not had the warranty now and since now it was done. So we want to start it. But if we delay it, we could be a higher year one and then a 3% off right. of that. So once again, that would be a risk, you know, not knowing. And I'm speaking in place of Anthony, not knowing the full facts. But that's a good question. Yeah, and what's the risk of it of anything happening between now and next year? Um, you know, we'll, hopefully we'll have more funds next year with the, uh, with the bonds. We can't, we can't use warranties. We can't use the leftover money from the Arnsville project to use that. Unfortunately not, because that would need to be used for capital expenditure or paying down debt, not for a debt payment, but paying down debt as like a, you know, paying ahead. Right. Okay. Well, my personal opinion is that um, adding anything to a year when inflation is so high and we are still working through teacher contracts, um, it's, it's just a hard sell to be able to say, okay, we're going to have three other additional items. Um, so I, like Tom, would like to see us move in the direction of either the 0 or 1.5 as a maximum in the tax increase, and I'm not at all saying that these items aren't needed um, or that we couldn't somehow manage to afford them because they're comparatively less expensive. It's, it's just the principle of being able to sell this to the public that's going to pay for it. Um, and I will say, too, as far as the district resource, resource officer, I, I think Tom is right in that we need more time. Uh, to research it, but also to garner public opinion and public input, um, maybe a survey, I don't know, just how many in the district would like to see that and uh, how would it be um, received for the cost, just a thought. Okay, well, um, you said zero or one and a half percent. Well, if you don't have any ads, I don't support a one and a half percent tax increase. Um, if you took the SRO out, your increase in cost is $66,500 out of almost $34 million. So I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I don't want to be penny wise and pound foolish. All of the buildings, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, when Shelley went to each of the buildings to get input for this budget, all of the buildings came back with exactly the same figures they used for the current budget. Yes, all their operational costs came back the same. So any increase... Salaries are not included within their building. Yeah, any increases are contracts and fact of life. You know, electricity costs more, that kind of thing. So while I appreciate the fact that... Um, 
adding to a to this in this time frame is not necessarily a good idea. Um, the amount that we're talking about, if you set the SRO aside, is extremely small in compared to the total, and um, may also be absorbed if the if the uh, variance that we currently are looking at comes in higher than 50000 to the uh, unassigned fund balance. That's an assumption, and, and there's risk involved with that. Um, however, we could 0% tax increase with some ads is, is, uh, gives me a, a, a comfort level of 3.089% for the uh, unassigned fund balance, and I and I think that would address your concerns yeah. as well. I could go with that. Chris, you have a comment? I, I like the uh, the zero with some ads. Okay. I'm with Chris on that one as well. Now, hang on. I'm, I want to go around the oh, table. I'm, okay. I'm uh, counting noses here. Okay. Michael? Um, I also agree with uh, zero and some ads. James? Um, yeah, I would prefer not to see a tax increase. So, zero and some ads. Okay. Ron? Uh, I'm going back to the assumptions again, recurring versus non-recurring money and so forth, we're using roughly a fourth of our savings account, both the debt fund and teasers. Uh, nobody's going to replenish that. Well, that's not necessarily true. It got there because we put it, it there to begin with. You can do it next year, you can do it the following year, and now you're down where we're really getting thin uh, to do it a third and a fourth year. We have – that fund started out with $246,000, and we have spent $1,000 of it in six years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that's there to use and so forth. Uh, the 520 – we're – I guess my point is we're using 520000 of non-recurring money plus another sixty. Thousand of non-recurring money. That's over six hundred thousand dollars, or roughly six hundred thousand dollars of non-recurring money. That, in a sense, is a shortfall. All right. We have to start looking at how we're going to replace or make up that money. We'll use six hundred thousand next year, and then plus so we figure out a way to make up that money. We're going to use another six hundred thousand the next year. Okay. My counter to that is we have never used any of the debt money, none of it. So the first time we want to use it, I'm getting pushback I'm saying, saying, don't use it. I'm saying just make sure that we're painting ourselves, we're potentially painting ourselves in a corner, that when this ESSER money and the federal money dries up too, then they're done it, bought the T-shirt, there's a lot of cuts in store for us. Okay. Having trouble. Now, I can't connect the ESSER money and these extra funds that we're talking about. Let me about. connect it for you then. We have our Apple funds and so forth payments in that. Right. All right. That's going to go away. Correct. That's a half a million dollars or 455000 whatever. Well, in addition to the 600000 now we're a million short or deferred, however you want to look at it. Money's fungible. I understand that, Ron. If you're saying you want to have a tax increase this year to uh, to have money available for next year, I'm, I can't support that. Well. But if you're saying that we're going to have these uh, ESSER funds are going to go away, I agree, and we're going to have uh, lease bills that don't have somebody to pay for it, I agree, and that might re probably will require a tax increase in future years, mm -hmm. but not this year. Right. And the money that we're talking about from the debt service fund and the PEASERS fund couldn't be used 
for those computer leases anyway. Unless the board specifically said, I'm going to redesignate the debt service money to general fund. Which they could do. Which they could do. Right. All I'm saying is, and I'm not advocating a tax increase at this point, but zero tax increase is wonderful. All right. But all I want to let you know, there's a rainy day going to come, and it's going to be some tough choices on the board. Been there, done it. Got it. Um, so I'm... I'm still counting noses here. Where do I put you on this list? Uh, undecided at this point. Ron, we got to give her something to go with. So I don't think undecided is a is a valid. Hey, what? We'll go on and we'll come back to you. I'm still processing. Jerry. Yeah, there's there's no way that I can support any kind of tax increase. The taxpayers, the county, or the school district right now, as Cindy said, I did some quick math as well, and you know we're kind of talking about these asks, the central registration, the <laughs> agreement, the school resource officer. It looks to me like there's other fat that can be trimmed. Whenever you look at expenses between 2021 and proposed. And now it's getting late, it's 9 o'clock, but, you know, 38% up uh, for function code 2100 support services for students from fiscal year 21 to propose. There's a lot of other fats that can be cut. Um, Wait a minute. You don't know that to be true. That's your assumption. That is an assumption, yeah. And the devil's in the details. Now, we don't have those specific details of what goes into those function codes, so... That is an assumption. So I won't go on on any longer, but uh, mine is the second option there, the zero with with some ads. And if the some ads means uh, central, yeah, that's central what, registration. That's fine above. That's my vote. Okay. Jim, I'm going to grant with the second option, zero with some ads. Sue, zero with some ads. I agree with zero and some ads. And we're back to you. Uh, probably zero and some ads. Just warning that there are rough shores and rough seas ahead. You know, okay, I, I accept that. It's pretty much an annual saying from you. The rough seas are ahead. Okay. okay. So... Rough seas are ahead. Got it. So, <clears throat> around the table, the board has, in essence, not in essence, has actually said that the SRO is off the table for FY23, and the central registration and next gen will be in, and we are going for. Uh, 520 from the debt fund and 60 from the Peasers fund, um, and an additional 50,000. The assumption is 50,000 to the uh, unassigned fund, which is baked into your numbers, uh, Shelley, earlier. So zero percent with those uh, two ads that I just mentioned, and we have consensus from the board. May I have a question? Yeah, maybe. Because the final cannot be higher than the preliminary. I'm, I'm not done yet. Okay, I'm sorry. Zero with some ads is what we want. I was going to mention something as well. Uh, what I am proposing to the board is we direct the administration to produce a preliminary budget with a 1.5% uh, budget, uh, I'm sorry, property tax increase um, for the sum ads um, and with the proviso that, uh, you know, and, and that's to protect ourselves. So if all of a sudden the state says, hey, guess what? We're going to give you half a million dollars less. 
we have some kind of a cushion there to help ourselves out. So, um, you know, the first thing I got is consensus, consensus on the zero. Now I'm asking for consensus on a 1.5% tax increase proposal for the preliminary budget. Um, and the proviso is we have no intention of doing that if the numbers stay the same as they are now. Does anyone have a problem with that? Can I just mention one thing? And I, I know that once this, we can't, we can always decrease it, but we can't go back up. I just want to be careful, and Ann Corwell, I know we have kids that are being, they're in the, the process of being tested right now. I just don't want to lock ourselves. If, if worst case scenario, we have either move-ins or the need of a teacher, I just want to be able to have a conversation about what does the board want us to, to look at doing to, to allow that to happen, if that makes sense. Not yet it doesn't. Okay. We have a number of students that are being tested right now to potentially be placed into special education classes. Our classes are at a very high level, which means we can't go over a certain number of students in a class. If we have to add a teacher because we're proactively planning, how will we counter that if we are locking ourselves into a budget that allows no flexibility? Where do you want me to cut is what I'm asking. What's the cost for that? It would depend on the new contract negotiation. Sure, but we need to have you a ballpark. You know, so factor in PEASERS and Social Security health care, easy number of $100,000. So we could do away with those ads then, right? Well, the ads would, would be do, part of it. Would be, the, would be 60% of it, 66% of it. Um, and I'm not we, trying to create issue. I just want to be <laughs> proactive in our... Well... At the, at the, you know, as we're uh, at the clock's reading 0 0.1, and now we're being told, well, wait a minute, we might have an additional add to the budget. When will this but testing be complete? We are, we continually test. Um, we will probably have a better idea how many students qualify and doesn't qualify by the beginning of next school year. Um, Right now, we're running, rosters are running probably 90% of max. And we have, um, it's just, I think with students missing school, we have a lot more kids that are being tested. And it's just something we've been watching all year, and most of the kids are qualifying for services. So um, I'm going to guess we'd have a better understanding probably August. That, that, that's my point. Like, it, we're not going to have that for yeah. this. So, I just don't want to come back to the board and say, we didn't know about this. Um, and I don't know the answers at this point with how students will test and where they will place and how many kids will be in. We can run... Yeah, it's, with it's tentative so to, to scenarios, so it, but it, it could. So the possibilities are some additional or no additional. And ninety percent, it sounds like are testing where they would need services. It sounds like the risk of not doing anything is pretty high. Or, um, no, sorry, the risk of uh, us needing a additional staff member is high. Well, uh, this, is, this is a troubling conversation for me because here we are at the 11th hour, and this is the first time this has been mentioned. Can, can I say something as the most, uh, I, I, I don't want to speak for the group, but probably the, uh, the, the wild-eyed leftist uh, tax and spend liberal. I probably was never going to go higher than 1.5%, so I think that the straw vote we were taking on the 1.5 in order to game the tax law, which I'm very much in favor of, Jim, very much in favor of, of gaming the tax law, 
that was the highest I think this board was likely to go. I mean, am I wrong? No. Because and because then this discussion is kind of moot because that's as high as we were ever going to go. We were always going to have to cut if we had to add a couple of teachers, uh, which is always a possibility. So I think maybe we're getting frustrated over this, and it's really a moot point because we were going to take the head nod on the 1.5 anyway. Is that not correct? So somewhere between now and and the middle of June, the administration needs to give us a better sense of, um, and, and I think I was just told they won't know anyway until August. And if you won't know until August, how in the world are you going to be able to hire a teacher for the school year that starts in August? Whether you had all the money in the world or a little bit of money in the world. So I, we seem to be preparing, you know, for all contingencies, and I don't know how you do that. All right. Did you have some some budget thing that you do? You think that what we're doing is putting is hamstringing you in some way? I just want to make sure that. I publicly stated the information that has recently come to my attention, like looking at where we're at currently with numbers, but also knowing that this testing will not be completed until August, and our budget is... Well, that's two months too late. Well... Can the budget, can the testing be completed sooner? It, it will not. I, no. I, I cannot... Control how, how, okay. how quickly. The IU is already out. down for um, psychologist. All right. Well, I don't. I don't know how to deal with that. I mean, I, I, I really don't. You know, you're. I, I can't support hiring a teacher because we might need it, and, and then we don't need it, or we might need it and then we do need it. Um, I think at this point we just have to say, we'll. Uh, We'll deal with that problem, that can, that outcome, when it happens, if it happens. Anybody else have anything? Well, I mean, I agree with the option to um, provide that contingency. For well, that was an earlier why don't we? See, when this got sidetracked, I think that's what we were doing. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is, does anybody disagree, rather than go around the table again, that we make our preliminary budget for a 1.5% tax increase, recognizing that we want to go with a zero, but we want to hedge that because we can't go up from, uh, you know, assuming the numbers change? I don't hear anything, so we'll go with that. So one and a half. Now, how do I get out of this? Thank you for this, Tom, by the way. Mm -hmm. And for your presentation. Uh, so we're back to you, Sue. Uh, item 4.9 is the appointment of a school board treasurer for the next year. How did, oh, I skipped down to that. Ah, 4.8 is the attempt to adopt an advertisement of the 22-23 budget. So. The item is the approval of the tentative adoption, including advertisement of the 22-23 UASD operating budget with final adoption set for the June 21-2020. This is just a formal process that I need in place here, please. So when we, when we uh, <clears throat> approve the budget in two weeks, you will then put an article in the, an, an ad in the paper. And it gets posted on our, the preliminary budget gets on the, posted on our website. website. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Anything else on that topic? Okay, Sue. Okay, next item is um, the appointment of school board treasurer for 2223. And um, 
The proposal is to appoint Gerald Walmer as the school board treasurer for the 22-23 school year for policy 0105. I spoke with uh, Jerry, and uh, he has agreed to do this, I think. You still in agreement? Yep. Okay. Usually he doesn't talk to the people first. It would be my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I picked on Jerry, um, asked him to do this based on his background, but if somebody else is interested, we can have that discussion. Now you're seeing people who are a table, a table full of people taking an intense interest in the top of their seat. Yeah, well, that might be that's a compliment. Yeah, that really. Yeah, Ron, where were you going with that, buddy? Uh, Sue Krauss is currently the treasurer. The uh, uh, Cumberland Perry representative. She's on the insurance committee. She's on the negotiating committee. It's time to give the poor woman a break. And policy. And policy, thank you. And the canter funds. And the canter funds. Yeah, how can, I mean, you know, you just can't turn around. You can't turn around without Sue being involved. Sue, pick it up. All right, and I believe this uh, this appointment goes from uh, 1st of July through the 30th of June. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jerry, for volunteering to do that. Okay, Sue. Uh, next item, 4.10, is the 2022-23 District Depository Bank. And the uh, proposal is to appoint the following as the 2022-23 District Depository Bank, ACNB and CWAP. Those are the same ones we've been using for a number of years. That is correct. Okay, and the next item, it's the... Uh, renewal of the 2223 PSBA All Access membership in the amount of $10,249.50 for the attached document. <clears throat> An increase of $244.11 over the 2122 cost. And I do know from attending policy that Mrs. Bretzman truly appreciates this membership and everything that helps the policy. It also provides uh, free training for board members, and so. Which is required. Which is, yeah, it's not, not you, you have to go through that. We'll have to figure out how to, to get you onto that. All right, any? I just had a question. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at it, and I, I don't understand that the package that we we are going to go with. Uh, standard membership plus $2,480. What is the plus $2,480 for? I think that's for the policy. Yes, yeah, it's policy. All the policies that we yeah. have. And, and the training, too. Cause yes, is it? Training. training. Yes. They keep, whenever the General Assembly changes something, and, you know, if we didn't have them, we would, sure. we would have to have somebody that figured it all out and helped us. So, but I think that's what it's for, the training. That figure is probably just the training. And then we don't check off the administrative regulations. Why would that be even necessary? I don't know. We really don't deal with regulations. We just stick to the policies. Yeah, we don't we okay. have a, it's the regulations right. part. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, try I, to put it in policy or not do it at all. Okay, thanks, Ron. And have we ever done the board self-assessment with interpretation? I don't know. Survey was that done a number of years ago? Well, we did it like the first year I was on. I thought, yeah, long time ago. Five years ago, yes. Sounds like it was very worthwhile. <laughs> They tell you what you told them. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> and then give you a bill. <laughs> okay, moving on. The next item, 4.12, is the 22-23 District Legal and Special Council of Services listing uh, as per policy 005. The stock and leader approved as legal counsel on April 19, 2022. Kegel, Kellen, Almy, and Lord, LLP, Dicker, Donaldson, Berriman, Caldwell, and Berkowitz, PC. What do we do? I know what we use Stock and Leader for. What do we use the other two for? 
specialty so, stuff? Kegel and Klein, Bond. Okay. And Baker, um, we've like used construction. Okay. And do they have retainers involved, or we just only if we use only their if we services, use them. we can okay. charge it. Okay. Okay. Next item is. Well, wait. Any discussion on that? Okay. Okay, next item is 2022-23 renewal of the professional software for Nurses Incorporated, TSNI, in the amount of $3,200 for from September 1st, 2022 to August 31st, 2023. For the attached quote, this is an increased cost of $80 over the 21-22 renewal. I just have a question. Um, I know $80 doesn't sound like a whole lot, but... Um, do we ever compare prices with any other service software for nurses? Or is it just the standard of what we do every year? The so nurses have provided a lot of input into what works for them. Okay. Um, we, we have received, there was a free software that was done a number of years ago, but then that has gone away. Okay. But um, it's an interesting thought, but we came up with this, I think it was the only one available, if I, if memory serves, but I, I can't swear to that. Well, I would really love to know if the nurses have any, I mean, I, I everybody has their favorite, <laughs> but... This, I believe, was their recommendation. Okay. Dr. Corwell, is there anything you would... Yeah, I, there were two um, when we did this years ago there were two different ones and this one um, had seemed to have the best training and also um, it actually matched with our there was a bridge that was available with our information yep so um, things rolled over okay. better, and it matched with power school so I think that's why we went with that okay time. thank you Okay, final item, 2022-23 uh, letter of agreement for DNA SAP liaison services. And the letter of agreement was True North Wellness Services regarding continuation of the SAP school-based counseling and intervention program per the attached document. The total cost of True North Wellness Services is $16,210.60, an increase of $472.20 over the 21-22 Okay, I have another question. <laughs> so uh, I took the time, like we're supposed to, to read all this. Um, and Dr. Corwell, I think you're overseeing this. Is that right? So this is your expertise. Uh, True North. It, uh, mostly the elementary, but yes, I'm I'm aware of what goes on in high school as well. And maybe you, Beth. I, I'm just curious. Um, we do need this for two days a week? Like they, they are on campus? We used to days. have it for more days a week, and they've cut back. Yeah. We wish we could get them more. Okay. Great. They are cool. I mean, I noticed that the one hour a week is free. <laughs> that is not going to work for us. Um, but does the 16000 just pay for two days a week? From August to June, or do, does this also include additional services that I don't see? This isn't residential or anything, right? No. And I recognize it's an expertise that It's one person, and they're being paid sixteen thousand for two days. I'm just trying to understand how that. Are you asking what do we get from yes. Well True North? Yes. Um, okay. Who knows what we get from True North on the administration? They will do drug and alcohol evaluations. If we have a student that comes to us that has had a policy violation, they can do on site the drug and alcohol evaluation, then make recommendations to the family and provide the services. 
So she is a dual diagnosis. She can do both, mental okay. health and drug and alcohol. So it depends on the student's needs, and she sees both middle and high school students, and she sees both. Yeah. So ballpark, how many students does she work with a year in the high school? I can get those numbers for you. Why don't we have a presentation? Have Why don't we do a presentation? So, okay. Super. So, Mr. Alvin, are you okay to set up a presentation for or whoever has the contact? Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying it's not justified. I'm just trying to understand better what what we're. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we go on to personnel, James. Okay. Uh, we have a retirement under uh, Section Five Point Two Point One. Johnson Short um, will be leaving us after 25 years in the district. Um, he will be missed as far as I'm concerned. Uh, for sure. Do you agree, Sean? Yeah. Um, and then moving down to section 5.4, we have the athletic supplemental contracts. ESY teachers, uh, uh, and then uh, a couple of homebound instructors. And we also have some additions to the volunteer listing and the uh, contracted services listing. I don't see anything alarming. Yeah. ESS, they list somebody. 5.6.3.1. Right, okay, so yes, on ESS we have a additional substitute teachers that we have No additional support support. And then um, under miscellaneous, Discussion, but uh, Dr. Dahl uh, throughout the summer, we asked uh, Dr. Dahl to be responsible for hiring, advertising, posting, uh, posting advertising, and hiring of um, and accept resignations and retirements during the summer months of June, July, and August. We uh, that frequently. This is a standard uh, perform activity that uh, we do at the beginning of the year to set the stage for. Given the amount of transition that takes place over the summer. Uh, Dr. Dahl, is there anything you want to add there? I would just say that we can't leave any grass grow under our feet. We need to move mm -hmm. quickly and swiftly with hires in this day and age. Okay. And then we also have uh, two individuals added to the translator list. Retroactive back to March and April. Okay. Any anything for personnel? The last item on our agenda this evening is um, a member of the of the community has approached um, the board uh, about the land that we uh, that the district owns at near Big or at Big Lavelle Elementary School, and uh, a member of the public thinks that. Uh, we could sell that land and and make some money, and presumably whoever buys it would, I guess, build something on it, which would broaden the tax base. And you know, all that sounds great if you have a buyer and if he wants to build. Um, but uh, we don't know any of that. But what I would what I would ask uh, Wesley is after the budget is done, doesn't that, we don't want to interfere with things like that, but maybe over the summer and, uh, put a short presentation together about how much land is there, if it's generating any any income right now, and and how you know how much 
what's the use of it? Is it worth selling? Are we better to keep it? You know, just get, make the board smart on the. As I recall, it's about 80 acres, and we lease it to somebody who farms it. Um, but but all that's hearsay in, on my part. So sometime over the summer, if you could talk about that, I'd appreciate it. I got it. Um, really, on a not to interfere basis, I know you're you know, sort of the trying to keep all the plates spinning guy, especially. Starting right. to fall. Hmm? What's that? <laughs> so they're starting to fall. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have anything for the <clears throat> board to discuss this evening? All right. We uh, have completed our committee meetings. Thank you very much for...